Hey there, welcome to this week's episode, which is going to be a Q&A episode. Have not done one of these in a while, so excited to answer many of your questions. And if you have questions for future episodes, you can send them to my assistant, Keely, by emailing support at fasttoheal.info. And the next Q&A episode, I'll be sure to hopefully grab one of your questions. All right, let's get right into it. I'm going to be answering four questions. The first one is from Mary. <clears throat> Mary asks, my blood sugar can be normal before bed, but over 100 in the morning. I'm not diabetic. What causes this? So I've done full podcast episodes on this topic I teach about this in Low Insulin Academy. This is called the Dawn Phenomenon or the Dawn Effect, whichever one you want to call it, but this is very common. And what happens around somewhere between 3 and 5 a.m. for most people is that counter-regulatory hormones are released to wake you up. So if you don't have any sort of blood sugar dysregulation, usually you wouldn't even notice this. It's just a slight bump up in glucose. If you have prediabetes, fatty liver, type two diabetes, metabolic disease, you might notice this more. So you definitely will notice this more. So if you're prediabetic or type two diabetic, um, you'll, you'll see this if you're wearing a continuous glucose monitor. And this is, that's really the only way you're going to see when these levels are increasing is by wearing a CGM. And I do have a link in the show notes for people who are interested in wearing a continuous glucose monitor, but they can't get one prescribed by their provider, which can be super frustrating because I love to wear CGMs on and off just to see where I'm at with my blood sugars. But unless you have type two diabetes, typically you won't get prescribed one. So I work with a company called Thea Health, T-H-E-I-A, Thea Health, and they provide you with continuous glucose monitors and they're very affordable through this company and they have a really great app and dashboard. So you can get the, the CGMs for just $75 a piece for a two week continuous glucose monitor, um, which again is very affordable. Most of them are more around $200 for two weeks, um, but you do have to pay for an annual subscription, which basically pays for itself even with just ordering one CGM. But that's the best way to monitor to see when the dawn phenomenon is happening and whether or not it is you know, more problematic for you. I will say this, um, again, if you have known blood sugar issues, prediabetes, type two diabetes, this bump up in blood sugar in the morning is definitely going to be more noticeable. And when you're trying to reverse type two diabetes, insulin resistance, blood sugar dysregulation, prediabetes, the morning blood sugars are almost always the last thing to correct themselves because of the dawn phenomenon. And if you are doing intermittent fasting and you're fasting throughout the morning, it can get frustrating because you're like, what the heck? My blood sugars are 100, 110. But then when I eat, the baseline goes back lower, like maybe you're below 100 or you're below 90. And that's normal because when you eat food, you release insulin rate you release insulin, especially if you're eating carbohydrate in that meal, or if you're eating more protein in that meal, you are going to release insulin in response to the blood sugar. So this is, this is very, very common. Now this person, so Mary says, I'm not diabetic, but my blood sugar is over 100 in the morning. I would say you're definitely pre-diabetes, <laughs> like you have some blood sugar issues. I like to see morning blood sugars under 90. Um, you know, of course we're going to have some bumps up here and there because if we've had a poor night's sleep, we've had a really stressful couple of days, um, parts of the menstrual cycle can increase blood sugar as well. So if you didn't sleep really well, or if you have very interrupted sleep, you might have a higher blood sugar, but if your blood sugars are chronically greater than 100 in the morning, you likely do have prediabetes. I would get, you know, a fasting glucose checked. I would get 
a hemoglobin A1C checked, and I would get a fasting insulin checked and see where you are at. But again, very common. It's one of the last things to turn around. You do all the measures that I teach you about in the course on this podcast and my social um, to start to reverse that insulin resistance. But normally these are, are some of the last things to correct themselves. Another thing that can be potentially helpful if this is happening to you is to <clears throat> make your fasting period a longer time before going to bed and really just watch what it is that you're eating at that last meal. We're more insulin sensitive earlier in the day we're most insulin sensitive around midday. So make that your bigger meal, less eating later in the day. And then you could even try um, fasting through dinner. So either having breakfast and lunch or a brunch and a late afternoon meal or early evening meal, and then get a good chunk of fasting in three, four, five, maybe even six hours before going to bed, that should help with those morning blood sugars as well. But they do take some time to turn around and that's very common. It's called the dawn phenomenon or the dawn effect. And like I said, I have just a, not long ago, I did an entire podcast episode on this very topic. So you can look back for that. The next question is from Rita. And Rita asks, why am I insulin resistant, even though I eat healthy and exercise too? <laughs> Million dollar question, Rita, right? Um, yes, if we could all just, you know, follow the guidelines that we've been told, we go to our doctor, we go to our physician, we're overweight, um, we have wonky blood sugars, what do they tell us? They say, go eat right, which who knows what that even means, right? Go eat healthy and exercise and all your troubles will go away. Well, that doesn't typically work, right? We're in this huge predicament of metabolic illness with 93% of American adults not being metabolically healthy, which is staggering. So why do you get insulin resistance even though you eat healthily and you exercise? Well, there could be many, many things going on here. Um, so this is a really loaded question. I could have done an entire podcast episode on this. But first off, it's like, how often are you eating, right? You might be eating really healthy foods or what are considered healthy whole foods, but you're eating really often. And, you know, you're you're driving your insulin, you're, um, you know, what's my, the word I want, I'm looking for. You're secreting insulin multiple times during the day. Your insulin levels are higher than what they should be. That's a problem because when insulin is high, you can't burn fat. You're in a fat storage mode. So that could be one of the issues. You're just eating way too often throughout the day and your insulin levels are high through, throughout the day. So that could be one thing. Um, another thing is you could be eating way too many carbohydrates or processed foods and uh, processed foods, processed carbohydrates, sugar, flour, anything, you know, the white sugar, white flour, all of those foods are broken down into sugar and they really cause big blood sugar spikes, which is going to in turn cause a big dose of insulin to be secreted because you have to get rid of that blood sugar in your bloodstream because your body can't have too much sugar in the bloodstream. You will pass out and you will go into a coma and you could potentially die. So this is why insulin is very important. It's just that we eat too often. We eat too much. We eat too many carbohydrates, sugar, flour, all of the, you know, we've been told to eat 55 to 65% of our um, food intake from carbohydrate, which is crazy. So even if you're eating healthy whole grains, you're eating a ton of fruit, you're having, um, you know, smoothies in the morning, you're having whole grain cereal, you're eating a ton of oatmeal, all of those foods are going to drive your blood sugars up and drive your insulin levels up. So we really need to get to a low carb approach and only eating meals to start with. And then, you know, sometimes not eating every meal and going longer periods of time with fasting to bring that insulin level back down so that we don't have insulin resistance. And if you're already doing those things, your intermittent fasting, your low carb, take a look at your sleep. Are you sleep deprived? Are, is your sleep interrupted every single night? Are you not getting enough sleep? Are you not getting enough restorative sleep? 
that drives your cortisol levels up, which in turn is going to cause your body to, to release more glucose. And that's going to cause an increase in insulin. I just wore a CGM a couple of weeks ago. I saw this all the time. I saw it when I was sleep deprived, my baseline blood sugars were higher. Of course, I can't see what my insulin levels are. There's no way to, at this point in time, there's, there's no way to measure your insulin throughout the day. It's hopefully on the horizon, but it's going to be a while before um, we get the technology to do that, but you can measure your glucose and get an idea of um, how much insulin you're going to be secreting depending on the glucose. So lack of sleep can definitely cause insulin resistance. A, a, a stressful time period, if you're going through a big period of stress or you're chronically stressed, I again saw this on my my CGM and I'm going to be doing an episode about what happened, you know, when when I was wearing a CGM, but stress played a huge huge role in my baseline blood sugars. Actually more so than anything, well, I shouldn't say more so than nutrition because nutrition obviously probably is going to have the most pull on your your blood sugars. Um, but stress played a huge role for me as well. So that can cause insulin resistance. Um Food sensitivities that are causing inflammation in your body can make you more insulin resistant. If you're a woman going through perimenopause or menopause, um, you know, starting in your late 30s, early 40s, you get more insulin resistant naturally as a female, you become less insulin sensitive. So we as as women going through perimenopause and through our menopausal years and beyond, we really need to change our eating habits and our nutrition. We can't eat like we did in our twenties and early thirties. It just, there's, there's a, a very <laughs> small percentage who might be able to get away with this, but the vast majority of women really need to change what they're eating, go to more of a low carb approach. Cause you just aren't as sensitive to those carbohydrates and you don't have as much insulin sensitivity. So if it's that time period in your life where your estrogen levels are falling, your progesterone levels are falling, your testosterone levels are falling, that all causes more insulin resistance. It doesn't mean that it has to be counteracted, that it, that it can't be, I should say, it doesn't mean it can't be counteracted. It just means we need to be aware of it and we need to take approaches that are going to help us to, to stay insulin sensitive, everything that I teach, that's, that's what we do. And um, another thing is you might not be active enough again, as, as you age and you start to lose a little bit of muscle mass, naturally, it's not a huge amount, but a little bit, and you're not counteracting that that's problematic. So, you know, increase your protein increase your strength training, lack of protein can be another direct cause of insulin resistance, despite, you know, eating healthy and exercising. So when you say you're eating healthy, I don't know exactly what that means. You know, that can be really anything, you know, there, the, that could be any approach. You could be vegan for all I know. You could be, you know, eating, 60% carbohydrates, because that's what we've been told to eat in, in our guidelines. So the eating healthy, I don't know exactly what you're eating, but you may be lacking protein and that's setting you up for insulin resistance. So my female students, I like them to eat at least hundred grams of protein every single day, if possible, unless they're on a longer fast. If you're doing like a 36 to 42 hour fast, or even a 24 hour fast, it's going to be very challenging to get that hundred grams of protein in, which is why I don't suggest doing those longer fasts all that often, maybe once a week, twice a week at most, but those other days you're aiming for a hundred grams of protein daily, maybe even 120 as a female males, more like 150. Um, so that could be why you're insulin resistant as well. So there's a lot of factors that come into play here. And even, um, you know, a disrupted gut microbiome can cause some insulin resistance as well. There are certain medications that increase your chances of being insulin resistance as well. So there's a lot of things that come into play. Leptin resistance can be another thing. Um, and then just chronic, the chronic dieting mentality 
all of those things can really just set you up for insulin resistance. But the main thing is, uh, is your nutrition, eating too often, eating too many carbohydrates, not sleeping enough, being overly stressed, um, and then aging and going through perimenopause and menopause. Those are the main things that you need to take a look at. Um, you know, it's not just, oh, I, I walk, you know, three times a week and, you know, I don't eat out like that. That's usually not enough to, to keep you metabolically healthy. Uh, but great question from Rita. Okay. The next question is from Cassie and Cassie says, I'm on Ozempic. Can I do your program along with being on that injection? Yes. And I would encourage you to do so. And if it's not my program, a program similar to mine, but my program is going to help you to establish a low insulin, low inflammation lifestyle. That is what I teach. So even if you're on Ozempic and you have not been given any sort of direction as to what lifestyle changes you need to make in order to be successful when you come off that medication? Because I think we both know, or we all know that there are very, very few people who are going to stay on Ozempic for a lifetime. We don't know the long-term effects, number one. It's very, very costly, number two. So for your insurance company to keep paying for that and tell you are no longer here is probably not going to be happening. It's probably not reasonable. Um, and number three, there, a lot of people have side effects. So they are, you know, at some point coming off Ozempic, they just don't want to be on a medication and an injection forever. Um, and number four, you might be losing a lot of muscle mass, which, you know, studies, studies show that up to 30% of the weight that you lose while on Ozempic can be muscle mass, which is the exact opposite of what we want. We want to conserve as much muscle mass as humanly possible, especially as we age. Once we start to lose muscle mass and sarcopenia, get brittle bones, not good things are going to happen. We want to age as a strong person, not as a frail person. Um, so Cassie, yes, you can definitely do my program. And again, I would encourage you to do so because inside low insulin Academy, you learn all of what you need to, to keep insulin levels low, to keep inflammation low. We go through the nutrition, we go through, you know, all the macronutrients, we go through supplements that are going to help you to maintain um, healthful blood sugar levels. So nothing drives me more crazy than somebody being put on Ozempic and just, there's no direction. There's no education. They just go get their injection. They are losing weight, which is great, but they're not eating well. They're not eating enough protein. They're not adding strength training. They have no idea what lifestyle to implement because Unless, because even when you go on Ozempic, yes, your appetite is suppressed. Um, yes, most people lose weight. Not everyone. There's there's many people that I've heard that it does absolutely nothing for. Um, and then there's others who have so many side effects that they have to come off of it. Um, but yes, it will do all these things. But unless you are changing your lifestyle along with the injections, when you go off, you most likely are going to gain most, if not all of the weight back. And now your body composition is worse than when you started because you've lost muscle mass. So going through a program like at Low Insulin Academy, along with doing the injections will, will help you to learn exactly when you come off the injections, when you come off the medication, you will know what to do in order to keep that insulin level low and to keep your inflammation low overall. So my program, Low Insulin Academy, is doing for your body what Ozempic does. It's just at a slower pace. Um, it's just the nat it's basically the natural version of Ozempic. And I do have targeted supplements that I recommend inside the course that are more natural, that don't have the side effects. Um, so yes, definitely, definitely, definitely would encourage you to do a pro the program along with it. 
And the program, all the lessons are lifetime access. I do have an, an um a live version of Low Insulin Academy opening up in just a few weeks. September 5th is when enrollment opens. I only have enrollment open for 10 days, you guys. So if this is something that you want to do, enrollment open is open September 5th through September 14th. This is the live version of Low Insulin Academy. I have two versions. Um, one version is on demand and you can access that at any time. There's 38 lessons. The lessons are all the same. The difference is I go through the live version with you and I offer group coaching every single week and you go through with a class of your peers so that you have more accountability and support. So if you are interested, I won't be running it again until January and I haven't run it in six months live so get on the wait list if you are interested, because what that does is gives you a discount when enrollment opens. Only the people who are on my wait list get emailed a code for a discount. So go and get yourself on. So it's fasttoheal.info slash LIA waitlist for Low Insulin Academy waitlist. And the link is in the show notes as well. But if that's something you want to do, um, get yourself on the waitlist. The waitlist, if you're on the waitlist, that does not lock you into doing the course. Definitely you have <laughs> a choice whether or not you enroll, but at least you'll have the discount if you do choose to enroll. This is going to be a big class because um I haven't done it in, in so many months and I cap it at 150 students. So if you are interested in enrolling, I would get on the wait list and enroll right away when enrollment opens. Again, it's only open for 10 days so that you can secure your spot. Okay, but great question. Um, and the last question comes from Sonal. And this was a really interesting question. When I saw it pop up, I was like, huh, that, that's a weird, you know, thing to think about. But Sanal asks, can insulin resistance come and go? Yes, it absolutely can come and go. And a lot of this, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle disease, right? Like prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, PCOS, high blood pressure, fatty liver, all of the chronic lifestyle diseases that are directly linked to insulin resistance all depend on your lifestyle. So what you're doing from day to day and the lifestyle that you lead is going to determine directly your level of insulin resistance. So if you're doing all the things to lower insulin levels, bring them back into balance and, you know, get healthy, get your body healthy enough to lose weight by reversing insulin resistance, your insulin resistance is going to resolve. Say you have a um, you know, fasting insulin of 15 right now and you work at this lifestyle, you bring down your inflammation, you do all the things to bring that insulin level back into balance, you balance out those blood sugars, you're feeling great, you bring your insulin level back down to a six. And, you know, your body is much, much happier and less inflamed and you feel great and you're following the lifestyle a year from now, you go back to what you were doing before when you had an insulin level of 15, you're going to get insulin resistant. Again, you have to follow through with the lifestyle that keeps your insulin level in check and low or you're just going to develop insulin resistance. Again, it's kind of like the whole, you know, like think about being pre-diabetic. You can definitely reverse pre-diabetes and get back down into a normal range before advancing to type two diabetes. But if you go back to the lifestyle that's going, that's making, that made you ill in the first place, it's going to develop again. And, you know, a good example of this would be like gestational diabetes. We know that those women who have gestational diabetes and wonky blood sugars during pregnancy are much more likely to develop prediabetes and type two diabetes because the genetic component is there, the lifestyle factors are there. And, um, we know that, you know, you are more apt to have blood sugar dysregulation. So then if you don't change your lifestyle and bring those insulin levels and blood sugars back down into healthy levels, 
you are going to most likely develop prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, probably fatty liver and weight issues as well. So yes, it can definitely come and go. And as I spoke to already in this podcast episode, you know, lifestyle is the biggest factor for in insulin resistance. Nutrition is the biggest factor out of your lifestyle that is going to drive insulin resistance. But the also aging comes into play, especially for women. Men might get a little bit more insulin resistant as they age, mostly because of the change in body composition. Um, their hormones aren't fluctuating like ours are. But as we age, we definitely become more insulin resistant. So it can come and go, you know, it can, you know, come rear its ugly head more so for a woman in perimenopause and menopause than when she was younger. So that can definitely play a role. And then there are, um, you know, hormones that all of our hormones talk to each other. So say you, you know, just had a baby or you're just nursing and you develop thyroid disease of some sort, or your thyroid starts to not work as well. Um, or you develop Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism, that in turn is going to drive more insulin resistance because all of those hormones are interrelated, interconnected. Same with cortisol, like I, I have already spoke to in this podcast episode as well. If you have high levels of cortisol that are super stressed, you know, you're super stressed out and your cortisol is off balance that's going to cause insulin resistance to come and go. So yes, insulin resistance is on a spectrum. So you can have maybe just slight, a little bit of insulin resistance where your insulin levels, maybe eight, you know, seven or eight, you just have a little bit of insulin resistance, or you can be, you know, you could have insulin resistance for years to decades, or maybe most of your life and your insulin levels at a 42 and you're severely insulin resistant, your type two diabetes, you are on insulin, you know, you have fatty liver and severe metabolic disease. You have high blood pressure. That is a, the extreme of insulin resistance. So it's on a spectrum. So it can definitely come and go. But I, I thought that that was um, an interesting question and an interesting way to look at it. So that's all for this week's episode. I hope you learned some good things with this Q&A. Again, if you want to have your question answered on the next Q&A episode, just get in touch with my assistant Keely by emailing support at fasttoheal.info. See you back next week.